Hi everyone, today we're continuing chapter 8 of Physics for the MCAT, and we're going to start with refraction. Refraction is when light moves from one medium to another and therefore changes speed. This is defined by the index of refraction, which is denoted by the letter n, and it's defined as the speed of light in a vacuum divided by the speed of light in your particular medium. As we know, light moves fastest in a vacuum, which is why we use the speed of light in a vacuum as a reference point. So by definition, the speed of light in a vacuum divided by the speed of light in a vacuum will give you 1, which is why the index of refraction is lowest for a vacuum, and it gets higher as the material becomes more refractive. So the um, index of refraction in air is very, very close to the speed of light in a vacuum, which is why when we do calculations, we use the value for the speed of light in a vacuum, even if something is in air. The index of refraction is very helpful because we know that light bends when it hits a different medium. We can see this through our classic example of a straw in a glass of water, where if you look at the straw, um, it is very visibly distorted. And this is because water has a different index of refraction than the air does. So we can define this bending through Snell's law, which states that N1, which is the index of refraction of the medium that you're coming from, multiplied by sine theta1, where theta1 is the angle um, that you approach the surface of the um, divide between the two mediums. So as always, this angle is defined in respect to the normal, where the normal is 90 degrees to the divide between the two mediums. And this product of the index of refraction and sine theta will be equal to n2 sine theta2, um, which are the same values but defined for the medium that you are entering. So we can see this in these three images. And something that's really important is that if n1 is less than n2, then this ray will bend toward the normal. And if n1 is greater than n2, this ray will bend away from the normal. We can see these properties through Snell's law because if n2 is greater than n1, then that means sine theta2 has to be smaller than sine theta1. The index of refraction is important to understanding total internal reflection, which is when the angle of refraction is such that all of the rays are reflected back into the same medium and none of it escapes into the medium that it was trying to go to. So it's important to note that this only happens if n1 which is the um, index of refraction for the initial medium, is greater than the index of refraction for the second medium. And so this means that the second angle will be greater than the first angle, and this is required for total internal reflection to happen. Most of the time when questions about total internal reflection are asked, you can simply eliminate most or half of the answer options just by knowing that n1 has to be greater than n2. Very rarely you'll be asked to calculate the critical angle for total internal reflection, which is the angle at which total internal reflection begins to happen. So what's important to know is that for total internal reflection to occur, the angle between the normal and theta2 must be at least 90 degrees. And this is because if it is less than 90 degrees, then the rays will simply exit out of the first medium and into the second medium. So the critical angle is the angle that corresponds to N1. So when we talk about the critical angle, we're talking about the angle of the first ray and not the angle of the second ray. And as you can see in this picture, when the um, first angle theta1 is this angle, it is not sufficient for total internal reflection to occur. Here we're at the critical angle, which is sufficient, and here we're past the critical angle. So total internal reflection would definitely happen there. So to find this first angle theta1, or also known as theta sub c, we use this equation of inverse sine um, of the ratio n1 to n2. And I say that it is very rare to be asked to calculate this critical angle because you're not expected to know how to calculate inverse trig functions on the MCAT. So if you were um, asked to do this, it would be for very simple values such as 0.5 or 1 you can choose to remember this formula, or you can just recall the formula for Snell's law, which you really should have committed to memory, where n1 sine theta1 equals n2 sine theta2. And we know that theta2 should be 90 degrees for the critical angle, which means sine theta2 equals 1. So we have n1 sine theta1 equals n2. And since we're trying to solve for theta1, we write sine theta1 equals 
n2 over n1, and therefore we get the expression theta1 equals the inverse sine of n2 over n1. So this formula should make sense. Next, we're going to talk about lenses, and lenses operate under the principle of refracting light instead of reflecting light the way that mirrors do. But other than that, lenses are governed by basically the same equations that mirrors are. And what's important about lenses is that they have two different surfaces that can both refract light. There are two types of lenses. One is called the thin spherical lens, which is the kind that the MCAT focuses on. And for a thin spherical lens, the lens is so thin that the thickness is negligible, and so we just don't consider it. And the thin spherical lens is governed by the same equations that the mirror is governed by, where 1 over the focal length is equal to 1 over the object distance, plus 1 over the image distance and the magnification, which is very, very important for a lens, because the entire purpose of a lens in um, terms of glasses and in contact lenses is to change the magnification of a particular image. However, the signs for the variables in these equations are slightly different. So first of all, for real and virtual images, these signs are opposite. So if you think about looking into a mirror and you see an image there, that would be a virtual image because it appears that the object is behind the mirror when really it is in front of the mirror. For a um, object in a lens, if you look into a lens and you see an object behind the lens, then this is a real image because the object is really behind the lens when it appears to be behind the lens. If, on the other hand, you saw an object on the same side of the lens as you, this would be a virtual image for lens. So real and virtual are opposite for lenses and for mirrors. Next, this is known as a convex lens, and this is known as a concave lens. So in the case of mirrors, we said that a concave mirror was going to have a positive sign for the radius of curvature and the focal length, and a um, convex mirror will have a negative sign. This is opposite for lenses, because for lenses, a convex lens is actually converging, and a concave lens is diverging. And so we always define um, a positive radius and a positive focal length for a converging system. And so for lenses, the convex converging lens is going to be positive, and the concave diverging lens is going to be negative. And this is for the radius and the focal length. I put this image here for informational purposes and also because the MCAT likes to ask about what kind of lens would fix myopia, which is nearsightedness, or what kind of lens would fix hyperopia, which is farsightedness. So myopia or nearsightedness is caused by the rays of light converging way too early, and this is because the lens of your eye is way too strong. And so in order to fix myopia, we would want to use a diverging lens or a concave lens. For hyperopia, um, what happens is that the rays converge way too far so it doesn't hit the retina of your eye and so for this we would want to use a converging or um, convex lens. What you would ideally want is for the rays to intersect at exactly the retina so if you forget any of these things just think about what causes myopia and what causes hyperopia and whether you would want a converging or diverging lens to fix it. The book does talk about real lenses, but I know it's not particularly important. I've never seen a question about it, and I think even the book says that it's not important. But the equation for a real lens is different from the equation for a thin spherical lens because you have to consider the um, radius of curvature for both the first surface of the lens and for the second surface of the lens. And so the equation for this is that 1 over the focal length is equal to, this is the index of refraction of the material of the lens, minus 1, multiplied by 1 over the radius of curvature of the first side of the lens minus 1 over the radius of curvature of the second side of the lens. This is called the lens maker equation and it's important if you actually go into making lenses or you go into ophthalmology. Our eyes are real lenses and our eyes don't have negligible thickness. Far more important than the lens maker equation for the MCAT is the equation for power. So if you ever go to a drugstore or a grocery store and you see a bunch of reading glasses on the shelf and it reports a number, this number that's reported is the power. And so the power is given by 1 over the focal length. Most times when you see these reading glasses at a drugstore, you'll notice that the power is negative. And this is because the focal length for a diverging lens, which we discussed before, is going to be negative. And most people who need these reading lenses are myoptic, um, which means they have nearsightedness, and therefore they're going to need a negative power um, or a diverging lens. And this is important for the MCAT because a lot of the time you'll get a um, lens given to you in terms of power and you'll be asked to calculate the image distance or the magnification. 
These following equations are slightly less important, but they're good to know also. So if you have multiple lenses in contact with each other, such as if you had a contact lens in contact with the lens of your eye, you would simply add all of the focal lengths together. You can think of this kind of like the two lenses that are in contact with each other basically become one extra strong lens, which is why you just add them all together. But if on the other hand, your two lenses were not in contact with each other, you would instead multiply all of the magnifications together. And this is because this has the effect of if you go through one lens and then the image that's created by the first lens becomes the object of the second lens. None of these equations are particularly important though. Aberration is just a word that means that something is kind of blurry. So spherical aberration is when, as a result of a lens not being completely perfect, the rays don't converge at completely the same spot, and so the resulting image is kind of blurry. Dispersion, on the other hand, is the effect of when light goes through a um, lens, it will bend differently depending on the wavelength or the frequency of the specific color and so sometimes the colors will separate when it goes through a lens and this is called chromatic aberration so sometimes when you look through a magnifying glass you'll see a rainbow as a result and this is why because the different wavelengths of color are separating from what used to be white light. Chapter 8.3 is about diffraction and I'm gonna be honest this is my least favorite section in the entire physics book because there is no intuitive way to explain the stuff you just have to remember the equations and alongside that this is not a section that's tested particularly often so it's a lot of work for something that is quite low yield first we're going to talk about single slit diffraction which is what happens when there is a plane wave that's coming from one side and there's only one slit through a an otherwise opaque material so light will enter from this one slit and what you might expect is that all of the light would end up right here but what actually happens is that this light happens to spread out into different angles after it passes through the slit and because of constructive and destructive interference it happens to form this pattern perfectly and what you'll see is that there will be some um, areas of high density of light and there will be some areas where there is absolutely no light and this is called a dark spot this pattern does continue on until after the graph appears to end but each um, bright spot will get lower and lower in intensity until you can basically no longer see it. And so the equation that governs single slit diffraction is at a sine theta, where a is the width of this small slit, theta is the angle between the slit and the dark spot. So we always want to measure diffraction in terms of the dark spots and not the peak of the light spots. So the distance or the angle from here to the dark spot is how you would define the angle theta, it would be this angle here. And this is equal to n, which is the fringe number, which is what number dark spot it is. So this would be n equals 1 because it is the first dark spot, and this would be n equals 2, which is the second dark spot. So for the second dark spot, you would be using this angle here. And lambda is just the wavelength of the light. The other common type of diffraction is called double slit diffraction, where instead of one slit, you have two slits, and light can enter from both of these slits. So when light enters from both of these slits, you get a lot more of a pattern, because more constructive and more destructive interference can happen between light from the two separate slits, so you can see that there are a lot more dark spots. And in double slit diffraction, the equation that governs this is going to be d, which is the distance between the two slits, multiplied by sine theta, where theta is defined as the angle between the dark spot and the center of the two um, slits. So this is equal to n, which is still the fringe number, so this would be n equals 1, this would be n equals 2, this would be n equals 3, plus 1 half multiplied by lambda, which is still the wavelength of the light. The book mentions x-ray diffraction, which is the same thing as regular diffraction, except with x-rays instead of visible light, and all the book basically says about it is that it exists and nothing else. The book also mentions a diffraction grating, which is the same pattern, but it's formed when you have a lot more slits than just two. So you have kind of like a double slit diffraction pattern, but it's more intense. Chapter 8.2 is about polarization. So like we know, light is a transverse wave, which means that the direction of a wave oscillation is going to be perpendicular to the direction of wave propagation. So in this picture, the direction of wave propagation is this way, 
And when you have just natural sunlight, the direction of the wave oscillation will go in all of the directions. But sometimes you want the direction of oscillation to go in a specific direction. And this is when you use linearly polarized light. So in this case, the linearly polarized light is polarized this way. So now all of the light looks like what you would imagine a wave to be, where all of the oscillation only goes in one particular direction. On the other hand, you can have circularly polarized light which it's much harder to make a polarizer for circularly polarized light. But basically, you can see from this image that a circularly polarized light oscillates in a circular direction, either left-handed or right-handed. Linearly polarized light is also known as plane polarized light, and the most important application of this, at least on the MCAT, is when you think about stereoisomers or chiral centers in organic chemistry, usually you would want to um, hit this chiral center with a specific linearly polarized light and then you would observe the light that comes back out and you could see that this linearly polarized light is rotated by a certain number of degrees and this would tell you both that you have a chiral center and the specific rotation of your chiral center. So that's the end of chapter 8. Thank you so much for watching and I hope this video helped you out.